mapu mankungwala mkutike ni COVID-19. Bacha maubu pankana bangana bwane bugaba. Batuwa nganda pankuseni isibili sifiji. Baga bunte na bufo pankuseni ibagudu bukila bukena di kutukukone kabana di unyen. Bade, kanumanju koko di buroko. Banja kubabaj, kubaitu bugal. Kwa kuwara nkuseni kukena kuburum. Mankungwala nkuya bagudubu di kurambe nfanga foli. Nafa, burum bawa kene. Be poi bukana di mukana ameriko sumutake COVID-19. Ula kusinde, urijak, munu poi fanga foli. Laini ya nosa ni ya nubaje, wanku 1214. Manu wala numiku di bukana kanu manjung, kwa koti kaya ntinori, munu regi wa sumu timi, di wabajimi. Gambia may be the smallest country in Africa, but it will host the second largest gathering of world leaders in 2022. To successfully host the OIC summit and put the Gambia on the global stage, the government of the Gambia set up OIC Gambia to mobilize resources for the implementation of key development and infrastructure projects on a scale never seen before. 20 new roads will be constructed across the country and the Bertel Harding Highway will be expanded into a dual carriage highway of two lanes on each side from the airport to Sting Corner. All people in the Gambia deserve clean water and a constant flow of electricity. Therefore, an entirely new water system will be constructed, including new transmission and distribution networks to meet the increasing demand. In order to provide a more reliable supply of electricity, the OIC Gambia project will replace and double the capacity of the NAWIC transformers and overhead electric cables. We will equip the police with modern apparatus and technical training in an effort to keep the streets of the Gambia safe. By building the largest international conference centre in the region, a five-star hotel with state-of-the-art facilities, first-class mobility services and improving the VVIP experience at the Banjul International Airport, OIC Gambia will position the Gambia as the leading conference destination in West Africa. With our partners in the tourism sector, we will reinforce the preeminent position of our nation, the Smiling Coast, as a go-to destination. The OIC Gambia will create strategic partnerships that calls for the involvement of local talent and businesses as a matter of requirement. In short, OIC Gambia projects will create jobs, boost commerce, accelerate growth, improve the urban outlook and lifestyles of many families across the Gambia. So let's support the OIC Gambia as it prepares us for one of the biggest global events. OIC Gambia, building today for a better tomorrow.
are broadcasting live for viewers in the Gambia and around the world. This is GRTS News at 2000 hours with me by Ibrahim Cham and in our top stories this evening. President Barrow makes surprise visit to assess ongoing works at three government project sites. Hundreds of mourners attend funeral of Ibu Wage as GRTS remembers the life and legacy of the late broadcaster, filmmaker and television producer. And later in the news, we will tell you about how one family is struggling to live in the aftermath of October's flooding. And in sports, you will hear from a gamin who lands the sub-region's top volleyball job as he outlines his plans for the assignment ahead. Away from home, Mali's Prime Minister Mukhtar Wani says he is open to talks with Islamist militants whose insurgency has made vast areas of the country ungovernable. I am Bay Ibrahim Cham. Thanks for joining us. news we begin with the president his excellency adam abaro on tuesday paid a surprise visit to three project sites in the greater banjul area to familiarize himself with ongoing works president barrow visited the university of the gambia faraba banta campus the banjul international airport and the demban clinic to get first-hand information on the progress of the ongoing works at these places the president was impressed with the pace and quality of the work which he described as important components of the national development plan details in this report by our presidential affairs correspondent momo Jalo. The President, His Excellency Adam Abaro, was received by Sir Taj Singh Bedi, the country head of Sapurnji Palonji, as he arrived at the University of the Gambia Faraba Banta campus on a surprise visit. The President was taken on a conducted tour of the site, which is currently being constructed as a final home of the University of the Gambia. Its construction is seen as a major breakthrough for the Gambia's higher education sector, which is a key component of the government's national development plan pioneered by the Barrow administration. For the President, this visit is highly significant as it will provide him the opportunity to see firsthand the pace of the works and meet officials on the ground. This contract has a history. There are issues, there are problems. The design and the costing. There was a problem, we get struck, but with the minister and the technical team, we were able to negotiate with our financiers. Finally, we agreed and we moved on. I'm happy that the project is now about 60-65 percent. It's almost finished. It has lot one and lot two. With lot one, we have to complete financing. That's why they are doing the, fin the, the finishing. The $104 million project is contracted to Indian farm Sapurnji Palonji, who have wide experience in the construction business, having undertaken a number of projects in the country. And according to officials of the company, they are on course of finishing the first phase by April next year, a feat the President described as highly commendable. President Barrow described the university project as one of the most important projects undertaken by his government, as it has the potential to finally bring all the faculties under one campus and enhance accessibility in the higher education sector. You cannot develop your country without education. And the university has been here, but we cannot call it real because it doesn't have where it is centralized. If it is centralized, you have a lot of advantages. If it is centralized, you are more organized. It's, it's more efficient, more reliable. You understand? And this is lifetime institution. This is lifetime building. That's why we never wanted to compromise quality. From the university, the president drove to the Banjul International Airport, where a $26 million project to refurbish the airport is in its final stages. He was also taken on a conducted tour of the building by the managing director of the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority, who revealed that the works have completely transformed the airport. President Barrow was highly impressed with the works, adding that the airport now meets all international standards. As the main air corridor in the country, President Barrow argued that it was imperative that the Banjul International Airport is upgraded to the highest standards equipped with the state of the art safety and security systems. The airport has changed completely. It was just, it is just the frame that was there. But everything has been postponed. The capacity has increased by 200%. In some areas, 
it have increased 300 percent. I'm looking at the environment. It's more conducive now. First time it was a house. Now it's an airport. And the gadgets they are using is world standard. Security and all other gadgets are all world standard. And I think everything that is meant for an international airport is now in this airport. The last place visited by the president was the Demban Clinic in Bacau. He's been equally refurbished to serve as a treatment center for COVID-19 patients. The Minister of Health, Dr. Ahmad Samate, revealed that the clinic has been well prepared to deal with the COVID-19 outbreak, even as the country sees a sharp decline in cases. The essence is uh, to serve as a COVID treatment center. Uh, whilst COVID is on. Uh, we already have uh, 68 beds here. Uh, out of that, uh, 10 are ICU beds and uh, about uh, 12, 12 uh, uh, high dependency units, uh, beds. So, so this is very, very important. It enhances our ability uh, to deal with COVID in this country. President Barra commended the staff of the Health Ministry for the coordinated response to the outbreak. Adding that the clinic will greatly enhance the ministry's ability to contain the pandemic. When COVID came, there was a lot of noise. We needed space. So we came together, discussed with our contractor, Mustafa Yai, and the international bodies, our partners, we are all involved. Uh, the Ministry of Health, we are all involved. So that we can create more space for, for instance, if we have more COVID patients. That's why we have created a space of about 68. It can increase, depending of the need. But even after COVID now, this place can complement the efforts of uh, the health sector. The Neban Clinic was used as a treatment center for the former president's traditional treatment program. But its transformation as a COVID-19 clinic and a future children's hospital is seen as major developments for the Gambia's health sector, as it provides more opportunities in the ever-expanding healthcare delivery system. Highlights of the president's visit will air immediately after the news. Meanwhile, His Excellency President Adam Barrow, President of the Republic of the Gambia, has declared Thursday, 29th October 2020, as a public holiday throughout the country in observance of Maulud Nabi, locally called Gamu, which will be observed on Wednesday night, 28th October 2020. The holiday is to commemorate the birth of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with an all-night vigil. Muslims recite the Holy Quran, narrate the life history of the Prophet of Islam as a model for Muslims as well as invoke religious songs throughout the night. President Barrow takes this opportunity with, to wish Muslims at home and abroad a blessed holiday. Meanwhile, veteran journalist, filmmaker and television producer Ibu Wage, who died on Monday after a brief illness, has been laid to rest. The seasoned media professional was born and schooled in Banjul, the capital city, and is credited for his role in the pioneering of television broadcasting in the Gambia. He began his work at the state broadcaster GRTS after its formation in 1995. Mr. Wage, who later retired from the state broadcaster, went on to expand his media practice by establishing one of the country's first media production schools. Hundreds of mourners attended the funeral, among them senior government officials. Usman Mane tells us more in this report. The demise of veteran media professional Ibuage sent shockwaves in the media industry on Monday evening following a brief illness. Scores of sympathizers from across all spectrum gathered at his bad place in Banjul at the Independence Drive Marks, where funeral service and Janaza prayer were conducted for the disease. A presidential delegation comprising ministers of defense and information, Sir Omar Fai and Ibrahim Asilla respectively, delivered condolence messages and later shared their acknowledgement of the immense contribution towards nation building by the late Ibu. A very sudden demise of a patriotic, uh, a republican, a hardworking Gambian who has contributed a lot, especially in your fraternity as the media. We've interacted lately these days, and he had some good advice and a communication strategy. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his infinite masses onto him, and may Al Jannatul Firdaus be his, his final resting place. And we extend our condolences to the entire country, and we ask the, the younger ones to, to keep, keep his legacy of trying to improve the communication of this country. He has spent a lot of time training so many young journalists 
myself, I went through his hands while I was working at uh, Citizen FM because Ibu was one of the first few senior Gambian journalists to be trained on uh, digital editing or what we used to call it then computer-aided radio. And it is very sad day today for us that uh, he died with a big heart that uh, he had for this country. Of late, you have all followed his uh, very good work promoting the Gambia, especially the new face of Banjul. The late Ibuwage was part of pioneers of state broadcaster GRTS before moving into the private media, where he set up his own production entity. Till his demise, he worked with the Communications Unit of the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. Former Director General GRTS Tombon Sedi and Esa Jalo described the late as patriotic and an educationist. When I first came to GRTS, he was there with Tijan Jabate and others. So I met them there. So they helped me a lot, guide me through. Um, he is was really a very hardworking and dedicated person and like to encourage the young, young ones. So he has done a lot of media work for both the private and the public sector. And right now we've seen what he's been doing with the TRRC. So he's somebody who has a lot of passion for the, for the job. And you can see around the tail end of his um, life, he had actually worked on trying to set up um, an institute where he would train young people uh, for the media. So Ibu, in a nutshell, is a man for the media. He has that what he's been doing for, and you can see that's how he guided his family too. I remember uh, when he was, when we were at GRTS, at the time that the Gambian music was just sprouting, we were trying to make videos. I have learned a lot from Ibu when he started making videos for, like, of Usulayon Jai, and the first ever Gambian music video on GRTS with uh, Musangom, Ibu was heavily involved in that. So those were the things that we have looked at, uh, particularly myself, and have developed on that to make a lot of music videos. The burial service was done at Joshua Cemetery, where friends, family, and colleagues paid their last respect to the late Ibu. His eldest son, Pa Abduwage, who is set to take up from his late father in the media landscape, mourns with mourners, describing the disease as a man of wisdom. The man was tolerant. He was patient. The man was caring. Uh, my dad was somebody who dedicated his life uh, in teaching young people. Uh, he started with his own children. That is why we are who we are today. And he extended uh, doing it with other people to the fact that most of these uh, media houses, you will see a product of Wax Media. Condolence continued at his former residence in Pipeline. Usman Mane, GRTS. The late Ibu Wage was among the pioneering cohort of the Gambia Radio and Television Services where he worked for seven years and engaged in different TV programming and production. He later left GRTS to set up Wax Media, his own production firm, and the Gambia's first film academy. As educator looks back at his career with the public broadcaster as well as the life and legacy of a man who left an indelible mark on the Gambia's media landscape. gathered to witness what many have always considered to be a far-fetched dream, bringing 54 independent African states into one union, which will one day be led by one leader. A veteran of the trade, a master storyteller and an internationally acclaimed film and documentary maker, Ibu Wage leaves an indelible mark on the Gambia's media landscape. The television broadcaster began his career like many of his contemporaries, at the Gambia Radio and Television Services, joining the then Gambia Television in 1995 as the first brand of homegrown TV producers ever to have worked for an established television entity in the country. He went about his work, solidifying a reputation for quality work with greater understanding of production and programming. He was a key figure in the production of some popular TV current affairs programs, notably the Weekend Spectrum and the Daily News Broadcast. A former presidential affairs correspondent, the late Ibu Wage traveled across the world and reported on landmark events. One of them was this 1997 plane crash involving a Spanish registered light aircraft which came down in Sarakundanding a few kilometers. As first respondents and emergency crews descended on this tiny settlement, so was a TV crew led by the late Ibu Wage. 
it will be one of the defining images of this multi-talented broadcaster's ability in relaying important information to a public who highly depended on the institution for information. Investigations into the possible causes of the crash are already underway. Ibuwage Ojia PBS News. He would go on to report on many major events in and outside the Gambia, helping reshape the country's media landscape. In later life, he took on major initiatives, working on major documentaries, filmmaking, and served the Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparation Commission. Ibu Wage has died aged 63, at a time he has gone far in developing and improving the ever-growing media industry in the Gambia. He has left a vacuum that might be difficult to fill. For the artist news, this is Isa Tukeda. Still on the demise of Ibu Wage, friends and colleagues of the late media icon described Mr. Wage as a veteran broadcaster who made significant contributions to the country's media industry. Giant Asfati Diba has been speaking to some of, the, some of them on the demise of the former media personality. The Gambia's media fraternity and the country at large is mourning the loss of a veteran journalist, filmmaker and television producer Ibu Wage. Mr. Wage, who died at the age of 63, was part of the pioneering staff of GRTS, where he worked for seven years before setting up his independent production house, Wax Media, and the country's first film academy, which has gained accreditation to begin operations. Widely credited for his efforts to promote media development through training and mentorship, Mr. Wage was one of the few media experts supporting young producers to learn the basics of the profession to become independent media workers. For the wider media fraternity, a legend and comrade has fallen. Until his demise, Wage worked in several capacities, including director of video and documentary at the ongoing Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission, a sad loss that has sucked the TRRC. The chairman of the commission described Mr. Wage as a talented and dedicated colleague. I found him a very, very, very able uh, individual a team worker, a colleague Gamma, who had some ideas and uh, was quite motivated. His colleagues at the state broadcaster where he formerly head of the current affairs unit recall a smart, perspective and highly resourceful professional who added immense quality to GRTS. Well, Ibu uh, is really an illustration, as I uh, earlier mentioned. You know, his stands are very well uh, in the area of uh, program production. So he has been producing programs, mainly the uh, current affairs program. He was the one you know, producing the weekend spectrum. That was a current affairs uh, flagship program in those days. Ibu was also doing a lot of documentaries. All these uh, current issues of the day, he was very much involved in producing programs you know, uh, of uh, current realities happening at the time. I worked with him in the news and current affairs department. Later on, he became head of current affairs, and I was head of news when the uh, unit was split into two. Uh, as head of current affairs, he was very productive in what he was doing. You know, he invited people over, he would venture out uh, and get material on his own. But um, I will remember him for the documentaries that he did at GRTS and for his work in the um, current affairs section. I find him to be a good professional. I've learned a lot from him because those days he had already worked at the film unit. He had already worked with a cooperative uh, and was doing the magazine. So he was well vast in issues and matters relating. And I was coming from radio at the time. I didn't have such a strong background. So I've learned a lot from him, and uh, he was a good professional. Ibu Wage was born and raised in the capital, Banjo. Wage is a product of Mohammedan Primary School, where he started his education in the 1960s at Lemon Street and Boko Street, before proceeding to St. Augustine's High School. In an emotional interview with GRTS Aziz Wilan, a colleague and childhood friend recalled the unique qualities that made Ibu Wage an outstanding individual. When I remember the inauguration of the Thai Republic of the Gambia, Ibu was totally involved. He was involved. He saw what went wrong. And that he was there to participate, to end the suffering, the pain. At the end of the day, 
Here we are talking about the Ibu Wage. I wish he was a living witness to hear, to witness. But that's Gambia. It's pain. We don't know who is who. It's all about politics and who you know. In his 40 years media career, Mr. Wage worked for several newspapers and broadcasting stations, including the new broadcaster QTV, which he helped to set up. Ibu Wage was an inspiration to generations of reporters. His gift as a writer and reporter distinguished him amongst his peers. And as a media leader, his opinions were highly valued and anticipated by the public. Ibu will be remembered as a filmmaker, a newspaper man, a trainer, television producer, and a mentor to so many Gambian journalists. He is survived by several children and two wives. May his soul rest in perfect peace. Father Diba, Pajatis. May God have mercy on his soul and grant him the highest place in Jannah. Now moving on, Tuesday's witness at the TRRC, Alulo, has told the commission how he was arrested and tortured by operatives of the National Intelligence Agency for his helping, for helping his uncle and one-time CDS of the Gambia Armed Forces, late Nur Cham, to escape following a failed coup attempt in 2006. Janke Ture picks up the rest of that testimony in this report. Ali Ulo, a native of Badibo who is hiding in Fajikunda, is the latest to testify at the Truth Commission, probing into alleged human rights violations committed under the former regime. Ali Ulo, a relative to the late Colonel Ndur Cham and former CDS of the Gambia Armed Forces, who was himself a victim of the then NIA. Mr. Lo's encounter with the intelligence officers happened when he helped Ndur Cham who was his uncle, to escape after the former army chief was accused by the German regime of being the leader of a field coup attempt in 2006. He said to me, I want you to take me out of this place because the thing is now uh, uh, worrying me now. Did he tell you what thing was worrying him? He said a coup was about to take place in the country. The witness further explained how NIA personnel came to his house around 3 a.m., where he was tortured, handcuffed, and dragged into the truck and taken to the NIA headquarters, where he was detained for three days. What can we find you when they came to my house? I'm not queen under. They came along with someone who told them that he knew where I live, the compound, but I don't know the person's uh, face. So when they knocked on my door, I asked, who is it? And he said, open up. I said, who is it? And the person said, open your door. time, around when I looked at my time, it was around 3 a.m. I opened my door and this guy slapped me. His detention at the NIA was a horrible experience as he narrated the severe beating received from Mark's officers to the extent of being unconscious. From there, he was taken to the security wing number 5 of the Mile 2 Central Prison where he spent more than nine years, six months as a convicted prisoner for treason. Father, in your statement, you also stated that you were beaten up to the time you were put into the cell. I told you, from the time I was taken from my house until I got to the NIA, why did you not? But only beaten, Abla so was the one who was doing the most of it. The others will do for a while and leave us alone. The witness told the commission that he was later pardoned by former president Yahya Jame, which led to his subsequent release. Concluding his testimony, Ali Ulo said the aftermath was difficult for him, informing the commissioners that monies, jewelry, and mobile phone taken away from him by the officers were never found again. Sittings continued Wednesday. For the news, I am Jenga Ture.
The National Agriculture Research Institute, in collaboration with the Rice Value Chain Project, are conducting a week-long training for agriculture extension workers and lead farmers in the rice production and productivity. Uh, Modla Mensane has more in this report. This is one big step taken by the National Agriculture Research Institution to partner with Rice Value Chain on a Transformation Project to train agri-extension workers and lead farmers on good agricultural practice for rice production with focus on Orilox 6 and Narika L19. The low adaptation of good practice in agriculture is immensely challenging production chain affecting the improvement of rice productivity in the Gambia. This is why NARI and its partners in the Rice Value Chain Transformation Project are targeting field workers to build capacity in the project's crucial areas to ensure sustainability. The important thing that will be trained on is post-harvest handling. Post-harvest handling is also very vital because according to statistics, even if you have a good harvest, you can lose, you can lose up to about 30% of your rice if post-harvest handling is bad. So there will be a training session on that too. So there will be a series of activities which you know you will be subjected to and all would be geared towards helping our farmers to improve rice production and productivity. The training also seeks to boost best practice in the field, taking measures to bridge the gap between extension workers and lead farmers as the country moves to successfully implement the rice value chain transformation project. It is important that uh, we test these varieties at our local level to see some of the threats that are, uh, that are there. And research is currently conducting that, and we all know that uh, extension is the main body responsible for disseminating this technology to farmers. So that's why it is very critical that research don't want to work in isolation. They know that very soon their mandate is going to get, uh, is going to, their mandate is going to stop, and they need to, they need people who are going to upscale this technology. And who are, the, that, who, are, who are those right people? That is the extension workers and the farmers. So today, as Dr. I, I, I rightly mentioned, your presence is not just come to for two, three days and you go back, no. We need to do this on rice because we want to close the gap. The gap is what government spend on importing rice. The, we should start here to narrow the gap. We, we cannot close it completely, but we try to narrow it. If we narrow it, then the, the foreign the, the, the money used, used to be uh, used to import the rice will stay with us here and then do certain other things. This training is designed to take them through the essential insight on research and development processes to implement the project. The rice, the national rice development strategy is founded on a vision of rice self-sufficiency to achieve rice self-sufficiency, strong one. So I hope uh, with this project and other projects coming, we will, as a country, at least reduce the imports of rice in this country, because it's not good for us. Participants will also conduct practical works on the field during the three-day session. The next phase of the program will engage lead farmers to boost capacity for improved production. Modula Minsane reporting for GRS News from the Central River region. One victim of October's torrential heavy downpour, which inundated the Kumbo South settlement of Madiana and other residential areas in the inner city, is in dire need of humanitarian support after he was left to live in a makeshift house with his family. Babasila went to find out how life has been for Ali Ujalo since the flood swept his house. The impact of October's ravaging flash floods continues to affect local residents with many struggling to rebuild following the devastation caused by heavy rains. Madiana village resident Momod Ali Ujalo is one of those flood victims still reeling from the damage of ravaging showers that submerged several communities leaving poor households badly hit. Jalo is now soliciting help from the public and philanthropists to rebuild his life as he struggles to recover and get back on his feet. Earlier, disaster management officials visited the village and pledged swift flood relief and support, but victims like Jalo are still waiting for that help. 
This year's rains brought unprecedented showers which have seriously affected inner city residents and suburban communities such as Combo Madiana, where surrounding waters inundated the entire village. Jalo was among many flood victims severely affected by these torrential downpours that left residential areas and townships badly exposed. Jalo and his two children and wife currently live in tattered moat house, which could totally collapse at any moment. Losing his livelihood to the pandemic and his house to ravaging floods has deeply challenged the family man who has nothing to fall back on during these trying times. I really need help to restart and rebuild my house, which is not even fit for habitation, but I can't take my family anywhere else, Jalo sadly remarked. Record showers and heavy downpours have left most families in dire need of support to make ends meet, but households facing the risks of homelessness face even bigger challenges with many like Momo Jalo struggling to rebuild their houses following the devastation of an unforeseen disaster. For Jarius News, this is Baba Silla. We will be back with sports at news as newly elected president of the Zone 2 Volleyball Confederations joins us right after this break. Watande, brought to you by Afisa. Be part of the amazing conversations with Gambia's greatest minds and personalities. Get ready to be entertained, inspired and motivated on the Watande platform. Plus, stand a chance of winning the shopping of your life. Call SMS 1010 for $3 only to win cash prizes and a free shopping spree. Join Watanbe Live on GRTS and social media on Mondays and Fridays at 9 p.m. Call in your water. Where Africell goes, oh, oh, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. The president of the Gambia Volleyball Federation, Baidu Dujalo, has been elected as the president of the Zone 2 Volleyball Confederation. He was elected unopposed on Sunday during the Confederation of African Volleyball Elective Congress held virtually. Mr. Jalo will now oversee the development of the sport in several West African countries and becomes the first Gambian to hold the position. We are joined live in the studio by Mr. Jalo himself. Welcome to the news, Mr. Jalo, and congr congratulations on your new position. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Now, how were you elected to head the Zone 2 volleyball body? Uh, actually, uh, the election, like um, you've just indicated in the preamble, um, is the election of the executive board of the Confederation of African Volleyball, and is virtual. Mm -hmm. And obviously, during this election, also um, the zones, the respective zones within Africa, also elect presidents during uh, as part of the proceedings of the Congress. And the election was more or less um, academic mm -hmm. because after the submission of my application for the candidature, okay. um, there was notification that I was the only candidate, and all the other countries have more or less endorse my candidature by not applying and competing with me. So I was um, elected on oppose during the Congress. Well, what's your feeling being the first Gambian uh, to head uh, such a position? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's a feeling of really being grateful and mm -hmm. being, you know, it's a very happy feeling also. Um, but also a feeling of huge responsibility as well, um, really going forward. And, you know, looking at what we have done in the Gambia with volleyball, I think um, it's, it has been a very good job with myself and my team here in the Gambia. And the results that we get is what really land us this position. I think it puts Gambia in a very good position now with respect to the sport, especially in the, in the sub-region. Gambia will anchor all volleyball activities of, of, of the sub-region. Um, really, most of the activities of the zone will really be coming out from Gambia and going to these countries, and these are big countries, so it's really uh, an honor, and, and I think also big opportunity. So for me, the feeling is really being very, very grateful, but also humble, and knowing that this is a huge responsibility and task, and really a lot has been asked. Mm -hmm of Gambia right now. Okay, now uh, what are your plans to develop the sport whereas you prepare to take up a huge responsibility that will see you oversee running the development of volleyball in several West African countries? Um, actually, yes, um, it's going to be a big task, but I'm also going to do this task with a team 
of, this, of, of other presidents of national federations in the sub-region. And really the plans are very clear because volleyball, if you want to really, is a sport. And you, when you want to develop sports, you have to look at the pillars. And the pillars, of course, are you have to look at the, the coaching, you have to look at the refereeing, you have to look at the administration of the sports and the athletes. So these, these really pillars have to be strong. You have to have good coaches, you have to have well-trained referees, and also organize a lot of activities for the athletes. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the plan, really, mm -hmm. to increase capacity, strengthen what is, what is on the ground, and increase the capacity with respect to coaching, refereeing, increase also the activities, the, the, the tournaments within the sub-region. Mm -hmm. Because without these activities, the athletes will not have the platform to perform, mm -hmm. and they cannot excel. So that is one of my main critical targets, really, to try to increase the activities within the sub-region, so that the athletes would have a lot of plat uh, a platform to, do to, 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 to perform and participate in a lot of activities and this is what is going to expose them and really make sure that the zone also participates, not only Gambia but many countries in the zone, participates um, in, in, the, in the continental competition and of course to international competition. So it's a huge plan mm -hmm. but like I said it's going to be a, a, a joint work, it's going to be a teamwork between myself and the respective presidents of the national federations in the zone. Okay now finally what does this mean for Gambian football since you are the president of the Gambia Volleyball Federation? Actually, um, it puts Gambia in a, in a driving position. Mm -hmm. This is the way I see it. It puts Gambia in a driving position okay. for volleyball activities in the zone. Mm -hmm. but also in Africa, because as the president of the zone, I'll be an executive member of the Confederation of African Volleyball. And the decisions of developing the sports in Africa will be taken at that level. So for Gambia to be present at that level, I think it's a good opportunity. And, and it puts Gambia in that position where Gambia is in, on the table to negotiate a lot. And really when you start negotiating, you start thinking of home on how to really bring a lot of things home mm -hmm. and increase the opportunities at home. And I think this is, this is for me what I also see is that Gambia will benefit. Mm -hmm. Because I think if things are emanating from the country, Gambia is being driving seat, I think a lot of opportunities. There will be increased opportunities for Gambian athletes, Gambian coaches, and Gambian referees. Oh, I never knew the Fullers could be, play for volleyball, talk less of being the president, but good luck on that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> well, news, of, uh, news outside of the Gambia is up next right after this break. In Mali, Prime Minister Mukhtar Uwani says he is open to talk with Islamist militants whose insurgency has made vast areas of the country ungovernable. But former colonial power France has signaled opposition to the idea, noting that Islamist groups have not signed a 2015 peace deal and that, is, that it considers a framework for restoring peace to northern Mali. CGTN reports. On this question, it is useful to repeat the conclusions on the national inclusive talks that took place here at home and which clearly indicated the need to offer dialogue with these armed groups. And I think we must see this as an opportunity to engage in far-reaching talks with the communities in order to redefine the contours of a new governance in the concerned spaces. That is a demand for which we must all think together and will require, and I think I need to say it and underline it, and I think our partners are conscious on this, it requires a sequencing and coordination with our partners. More specifically, those who intervene militarily in our country. Like you, I have read the declaration of the Secretary General of the United Nations, but I read it in full. If it doesn't bother for me to read it out, we need a global vision for Sahel. There will be groups with whom we will be able to talk and who have an interest in engaging in this dialogue in order to become the political actors of the future. But there remains those whose terrorist radicalism is such that we will have nothing to do with them. That is the Secretary General of the United Nations in the same declaration.
Negotiations between Ethiopia, Egypt and Sudan over the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam resumes today. The three parties have been at odds over the operation of the controversial dam. CGTN's Adel al mukhouri reports. And is um, equal in terms and the effect that they are worried and concerned about uh, from the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. Um, throughout the negotiations, um, despite some um, uh, minor p differences in their points of view, but the general philosophy and the general concept for them is to guarantee a legal binding agreement uh, between them and um, Ethiopia uh, and that they also want to put a dispute mechanism um, so that they can make sure that their water share will not be affected and if anything happens um, any sort of differences between the three countries happens um, they have already a, a set uh, agenda and a set political or legal way to pursue uh, which all the countries uh, all the three countries are agreeing upon uh, before both of them are concerned about um, the um, shortage that could happen uh, from the Grand and Sons Dam to, to the, their shares uh, of water. Of course, by geography, Juda uh, Sudan's uh, impact from the dam would be much less than Egypt as it can uh, manage to take its water share first as the water passes through it, then, e then goes to um, Egypt. But overall, um, they are both insisting on pursuing peaceful talks with uh, Ethiopia. They want to reach a unanimous deal and they want to see guarantees Well, that wraps up this news bulletin, but here's a quick look at our top stories. His Excellency President Adam Abaro has made surprise visits to assess ongoing works at three government projects in sites, including the UTG Faraba Banta campus, the Banjul International Airport, and Demban Clinic. Hundreds of mourners have attended the funeral of Ibu Wage, who died aged 63, and GRTS is remembering the life and legacy of the late broadcaster, filmmaker, and television producer, who has contributed immensely to the development of of the country's media. Victims of October's floods in Madiana village are calling for urgent support. And in sports, Baidu Dujalo, the newly elected president of the Zone 2 Volleyball Confederation, has outlined his plans to develop the sport in the subregion. Away from home, Mali's Prime Minister Mohtar Wani says that he is open to talks with Islamist militants whose insurgency has made the country ungovernable. Well, that's all we had in this edition of the news. Thanks for the pleasure of your company. Please enjoy the rest of our programs.